you um, all for uh, coming, and it's a pleasure um, for me to be here. I was telling Kathleen and Catherine before that probably 10 or 15 years ago, it would have been unheard of to have um, a five-part uh, lecture series on Alfred Russell Wallace. It would have been quite usual to have one on Darwin, so I think that um, that's a sign of the greater interest um, generated uh, by Wallace now. Um, uh, and I hope to do my share on, on that part. Um, the lecture ser series has been called More Than Natural Selection, as most of us know here. Um, Wallace, Wallace's major claim to fame, as was Darwin's, was the um, discovery or elucidation of the principle of evolution by natural selection. Um, however, the speakers in this series have been really focusing on what we might call other aspects of Wallace. Um, um, and, uh, and today I'd like to look at one that I think is particularly um, interesting and in fact maybe even more interesting to us uh, in 2013 than it was in 1870s, 1880s when, shall we say, the uh, technological and scientific revolution of the modern age was really getting started. And uh, what I'm going to look at is um, then Wallace's views on the um, social, political, and environmental consequences of um, scientific and technological progress, um, or what um, you know, I've termed uh, what he uh, saw as the problems possibly associated with science and technology before it had assumed the sort of fairly um, monumental shape that it has um, in our society. Um, so just to begin with, just to set up a little bit of um, background, and then I'll get on to the things that Wallace saw as important. Um, certainly there was no lack of thinkers in the um, Victorian period in the 19th century who had ambivalent views about science and technology. Um, sometimes it's hard for us to think that not everybody um, all over the world and throughout uh, the history of the world has thought that science and technology were the answers to every um, problem facing humanity. Um, uh, and so in the 19th century, there were certainly a number of, of individuals who were not all that um, enthralled by the idea of you know, unlimited scientific and technological industrial um, advance. Um, however, most of these people tended to Based their sort of reservations on science and technological advance, um, uh, primarily on religious grounds, and I need you know go um, that certainly is nothing uh, new. The, the so-called difficulties perceived to exist between science and religion, um, or aesthetic different uh, difficulties. People, um, poets, writers, artists who bemoaned the sort of increasingly uh, darkened face of, uh, here we're talking about um, industrial England. Um, uh, Wallace, though, is of interest because almost alone among the scientific luminaries of that period, um, he was really one of the few to offer a critique of science and technology. Um, uh, and he was also unusual in the sense that he made his views publicly known. So he wrote just as he was writing you know, his brilliant works on biology. Um, uh, he also um, uh, wrote several books on the potential difficulties um, involved in an all too sort of you know great cultural embrace of science and technology. And Wallace wanted to make um, what he thought was an obvious point, but one that he um, believed might get sort of um, overwhelmed by the great triumphs, initial triumphs of science and technology. And that was that science is deeply embedded 
in a very real culture, in a very real set of obviously financial economic considerations, but political um, considerations, um, ethical considerations, uh, philosophical considerations, and so forth. Um, and he made the point that I'm going to try to um, sort of flesh out a bit more here. Um, in a work that he titled somewhat ironically, The Wonderful Century, and that was published um, at the end of that wonderful century in 1898, um, he said the following, when the brightness of future ages shall have dimmed the glamour of our material progress, the judgment of history will surely be that the ethical standard of our rulers was a deplorably low one, and that we were unworthy to possess the great and beneficent power that science has placed in our hands. So that might not be that um, unfamiliar perhaps to some of us today, um, but again I want to stress the point that um, um, for the 19th century that was a probably very radical view to come from a scientist and a, and a rather famous scientist um, at that. And uh, it's very interesting that when most of his contemporaries were celebrating, you know, the glories of the Victorian age, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, Wallace seemed to render in this book the wonderful century, uh, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, uh, that indeed, even then, you could see that perhaps the negatives outweighed the positives. Okay, so what I just want to sort of um, emphasize at the beginning that uh, Wallace was in no respect anti-science or anti-technology. He devoted the better part of you know a life um, that lasted more than 90 years. He died at um, 91 years old um, to you know churning out you know one scientific work after another. But he also felt that if we were to, or if, um, uh, well, we're another story down the line, but if, <laughs> looking at it from that perspective, um, if uh, humanity wanted to gain the most possible from science and technology and not um, uh, be overwhelmed down the line by negative consequences, we should at the outset recognize what some of the dangers as well as virtues of a commitment to science and technology. And I, I just to um, repeat, it's perhaps difficult um, in some respects in our own age uh, to um, when our civilization is so um, deeply um, um, embedded in science and technology to recognize that there was a time when this was what was not so and in fact that's another part of our story in the 19th century um, most of the scientific publicists if we want to uh, call them that people like um, a number of Darwin's friends Thomas Henry Huxley I think perhaps we've heard of the name Huxley um, were concerned with proving the opposite. The burden on them, it seemed, was that in order to make governments, um, businesses, um, the uh, culture at large more responsive and um, conducive to the development and embrace of science and technology, they had to win over the um, people from an earlier point of view. And the way in which this was done, that is, why to um, uh, um, indicate to people that something that was fairly uh, not that common um, scientific and technological progress, why that was something to be cherished. This is before we get to Wallace. And the argument in brief there is what um, we might call the, uh, or what has been called, the rise of scientific naturalism or the rise of scientific materialism. The idea that there was something about the scientific way of looking at the world that rendered science a superior way of knowing um, and ultimately that science was a knowledge and the truths that came out of science um, were to be embraced because they were superior to traditional religious 
axioms, uh, traditional cultural norms, etc. Um, so um, what uh, Wallace was fighting against was the not only the rising tide of scientific um, and technological discoveries and inventions, but a very powerful um, um, movement on the part of the, shall we say, the vanguard of the scientific establishment um, in the 19th century, um, uh, who were really laying the groundwork for what we might call scientific culture. So Wallace had to do battle not only um, against the sort of the uh, advent of electric lighting, uh, and the rest of it, which were you know, pretty wonderful if you hadn't. Um, uh, they made the cities safe for um, crime and mugging. No, they made the cities safe um, and, 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 uh, and all sorts of other things that we're familiar with. So Wallace not only had to sort of deal with the fact that science, the, um, the first manifestations of science and technology seemed to be wondrous. He also had to uh, do battle with those um, the, in the vanguard of the scientific establishment who were trying to show that not only was science and technology uh, good and attractive and wonderful, but that it was the superior way of knowing and that not only was science and the modern scientific method a better way of understanding astronomy, of understanding chemistry, of understanding biology, it would and it was hoped, um, become the model for um, advances in all other areas of knowledge. So it was the 19th century that wit witnessed, um, uh, not sort of, um, I think, coincidentally, um, the rise of what might be called secularization, the triumph of the sort of rational way of knowing, the reasonable way of knowing, um, and also the um, the origins of the social sciences. It was here, you know, part and par parcel of this sort of um, rising tide of scientific naturalism um, and scientific, the triumph of scientific explanation um, uh, was the belief also that the, um, the virtues of science, the objectivity that it was assumed that the scientific approach yielded that was unlike other ways of knowing the world. The objectivity, the truth value of science, um, what's been called the um, ideological neutrality of science, science doesn't take political sides, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, that, um, uh, that was a very potent bundle, not just the scientific theories that came forward and the technological advances came forward, but the belief that here at last was an end to human misery, um, error, darkness. Um, the scientific method seemed to promise that for all. And um, uh, without going into that, um, any further. Um, by the end of the 19th century, that became, that was becoming a difficult tide, um, or a diff, I guess metaphors are bad, uh, for me, a difficult wave to counter. So what I want to um, look at then is what Wallace's reservations were about science, science and technology, but also um, see him as someone who was um, really questioning what was coming to be known as professionalized science. Was it really appropriate to um, allow science to move beyond any type of constraints or judgments on the assumption that it was a value-free enterprise that would only yield truth and would only bring about political um, uh, agreement um, religious sort of um, uh, un, the, the lack of necessity for religion and so forth. So Wallace really was trying to show um, or trying to set out a blueprint for um, how we might best exploit the advantages of science and technology and industry and no doubt, no doubt they're numerous and they continue to be numerous but somehow um, try to envelop science within a broader perspective and that really sets attention I think for 
um, a lot of what we know about modern, modern science and the public's response to science, that there's the belief that because scientists, scientists um, uh, uh, and engineers are expert in certain areas, they then gain expertise in all areas related to that um, scientific development. And so the scientist can speak um, authoritatively, I guess is the most important word, about the um, environmental consequences of a new type of industry being located here, or a new, or the ethical consequences of a new type of medical advance. So Wallace wanted to um, indicate why, in his view at least, that was a very dangerous uh, course uh, to follow. Uh, it, part of the reason why Wallace, you might ask, why did Wallace come to this um, sort of in the 19th century unusual? outlook on science, and one could argue that it's um, not uh, widespread even today, although that's becoming a bit harder to argue. And a bit of this has to do with his own biography. That is that um, Wallace um, uh, spent the very early part of his years in two sets of travels um, that were certainly two sort of um, uh, dominate his life. One were, was a six years um, um, stay in the Amazon region in which he was investigating, we can't forget that he is most uh, well known and uh, justly known for you know, the theory of evolution by natural selection. He was looking for a key to solve the mystery of why biological species, animals and plants existed where they did over the globe and in the form uh, in which they did. So we can say he had a scientific objective at the start. But when he went first to um, the Amazon in the period of, um, uh, I should know better, but um, um, 18, um, 38 to 1844, and then came back to England for a few years, and then went off again for eight years until about 19, excuse me, 1854, to the what was then known as the Malay Archipelago. He was he went to those regions because he felt that they would yield the best um, answers that he needed about plants and animals in a fairly untouched environment. So it was almost as if he was viewing nature's laboratory. Darwin went um, to the Galapagos. Um, but uh, in both of those cases, in both of those um, uh, regions that Wallace spent really the first 14 years of his life, he also had a keen eye to the human inhabitants of those regions. And you can well imagine that, certainly in the middle of the 19th century, if you were exploring the Amazon and spending six years there, or then spending eight years of your life exploring, living in um, uh, the Malay Archipelago, um, those are two regions that couldn't have been more different in, uh, than possible from England and, let's say, industrializing Europe. So what Wallace had to see, and what he certainly did see, was um, the um, people and the cultures among whom he was working. Uh, and the thing that he realized very quickly was that the, the general European belief, and it came to be the belief of sort of um, Canada and the United States, which were set, settled um, in large part by um, uh, European um, um, uh, emigrants, um, the general assumption was that of what was called the white man's burden, the belief that it was European situ uh, civilization that had reached the highest point of civilization in the 19th century, superior to all other cultures. And the reason for this superior uh, superiority was in large part, not exclusively, but in large part due to the powers given European civilization by its science and technology. I mean, there was no doubt about it that that was the first, you know, scientific technological region of um, the world. And rather than um, seeing that the cultures that into which um, he was coming in contact as being barbarian, 
inferior to Western civilization, in need of a strong dose of Westernization, he found that in many respects um, the uh, catalog of virtues and vices of Europe from a cultural point of view were indeed uh, greater than they were in, some, in these environments that he was living in. He did not see any clear-cut superiority of European um, politics to uh, indigenous politics, so forth and so on. So from the very outset of his career, he got, whether he was looking for it or not is another thing, but a very mixed message. He didn't see that um, uh, a culture that imbibed more and more of science and technology was going to be necessarily a better one, a superior one. And that was another one of the mantras of the Victorian age. And whether rightly or wrongly, I think we'd have to agree that it's become the mantra of much of subsequent history. You know, the sort of technological scientific steamroller has really sort of um, uh, become the global um, sort of um, uh, situation. So that's what we see um, uh, Wallace um, dealing with. That is, he comes with a somewhat open mind from a cultural perspective, political respect, perspective, religious perspective, which was very another unusual thing about him in the 19th century. And this, as I repeat, was, you know, one can always talk about the other Wallace, the unusual Wallace, because by the standards of that time and perhaps even of our own time, uh, he did many things that would be considered to be odd, had odd thoughts for a scientist. Uh, one other area before we get on to a couple of the specific works that um, in which Wallace you know, puts forward these ideas, um, <coughs> excuse me, was his um, um, his own battle with um, reputation that, uh, and this is partly where biography comes to influence, you know, um, individuals, not surprisingly, but uh, we tend to gloss over that um, uh, um, often enough in history. Uh, whereas Darwin and a number of other scientists came from rather privileged backgrounds, they had university educations, they were able to pursue uh, careers that did not necessarily seem all that remuner remunerative at the outset because they weren't that in need of remuneration. Not every scientist, but a, a, a galaxy of the well-known ones in the 19th century were individuals who could afford not to be concerned with, you know, some of the other practicalities of life. Uh, Wallace came from a very different background, um, and he had really to struggle for much of his youth, and his family had to also. He never had, surprisingly enough, was such a smart man, or maybe not surprisingly, never went to university. He didn't really have any education beyond what we might call middle grade school then as opposed to all these other individuals who had years of uh, university and some, you know, many of the scientists of the day were doctors, lawyers, um, philosophers. So Wallace, I don't know, like to overplay this card, but Wallace was sensitive to, um, shall we say, more issues than might have been the case with a number of other people who could focus only on their intellectual pursuits. Wallace seemed to be, from the outset, concerned with all facets of the sort of human, um, uh, um, the human situation. So basically, um, uh, Wallace um, comes back to England um, from the Malaya Archipelago and publishes his first major work in 1869. And this is called the Malay Archipelago. And it's uh, really um, a study of the um, animal and uh, plant and ecological environments that Wallace sort of came in contact with in the Malay Archipelago. But also, um, it's a travel book and um, uh, 
it repays reading to this day. It's beautifully written and very fascinating. But what you see side by side with Wallace's sort of naturalist's history are his observations of the various um, uh, groups, races, all these words are problematic terms, but um, uh, that he came in contact with. And again, um, uh, he concluded this work, which was very popular and very widely read, with um, a, 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 an ending that many people found startling. Uh, he said that he had been re repeatedly struck, um, quote, during his travels, by the remarkable fact that among people in a very low stage of civilization, we find um, some approach to a perfect social state in which there are none of those wide distinctions of education and ignorance, wealth and poverty, master and servant, which seem to be the product of um, progressive industrial society. Um, and he concluded, that, therefore, the, um, the, this work um, somewhat startlingly, startlingly sorry, startlingly, um, with a denunciation of the very civilization from which he had come from and to which he was returning and to which he would have to, or in which he would make his living. Um, so Wallace really um, gave a mixed message, shall we say, from the beginning of his career as to where um, all of this was going. And the reason why I, I um, bring this up is, um, among other reasons, is that um, I think it was brought forward in, in some of the earlier uh, lectures that Wallace, um, if you take the pair Wallace and Darwin, Wallace sort of fell into um, sort of uh, uh, oblivion or obscurity to some degree for a good hundred years or so. And one of the reasons we have to ask for that, uh, about that is why, if these two men you know, were equally um, significant in uh, developing the theory of evolution by natural selection. Why has Darwin's stock simply soared and soared and soared since um, the Victorian period? And Wallace's stock really, you know, went bust, you know, went nowhere, um, to put it bluntly. Um, isn't that a crime, a tragedy? Yes, it is. Um, but we're here to right those wrongs. No. Um, uh, um, and part of the reason for that is that because the types of things that I'm going to bring forward from, uh, um, from Wallace's pen now um, were considered so um, uh, radical, so um, traitorous almost, to the rising scientific and political establishment of certainly Great Britain at that period and then Europe, um, and uh, we'll see also um, Canada and the United States, that Wallace um, came to be regarded um, at, in one respect as a brilliant scientist, but in another respect, someone who was doing bizarre things and held all, all sorts of um, political views, economic views, racial views, gender views, um, even that one was not expected to hold in the Victorian period. So there have been many arguments as to why Wallace sort of went under the ra radar as um, Darwin you know, rose above it. And uh, part of that is that Wallace came to be regarded as a sort of mixed bag himself, a brilliant scientist who had these unfortunate lapses, inexplicable lapses into praises about socialism, let's say, or praises about gender equality. So Wallace uh, seemed not to make sense, and over the, you know, in the, the first couple of decades, or first half century of the, tw of the 20th century, um, uh, Wallace sort of faded um, out of the picture. Um, in any event, um, let's just get to a couple of his um, works in which he, um, or a couple of the events in his life in which his ambivalent views about science and technology um, come most clearly to the fore. Um, one of the first things, and there's you know, just a lot 
um, to say here, so I will do nothing more than mention it. But Wallace had also spent some years before he started out um, in uh, as a sort of a naturalist explorer, um, shall we say, in his um, teenage years, um, was a land surveyor. So he uh, became very interested in exactly um, what the nature of land and more importantly property was in 19th century Great Britain. And he was very clear since many of the things he was hired to do dealt with sort of um, surveying the proper limits of estates, um, finding out where estates could be increased and so forth, um, very quickly became clear that there um, was a great inequity in wealth, big surprise, but also came to understand where that inequity rose from. And so for Wallace, one of the great inequities and um, uh, disgraces of 19th century society was the um, notion of landed wealth versus you know, powerless peasant. Okay, So he has that, in a sense, in his gut. Um, uh, when he um, is um, uh, working in the 1870s and 1880s, he brings back these experiences of the land and the people and the inequity in, um, in uh, wealth and connects them to the second source of wealth and prosperity um, in Great Britain, and that is that associated with the um, rising industries, the rising businesses that were making their, for their fortune for their um, owners um, uh, through science, uh, scientific and technological advances. So uh, basically Wallace saw at the very outset that the so-called blessings of science and technology, which might have been considered good, certainly could not be considered as such because they were uh, the, the blessings were distributed so unequally in society. And that was again, I mean, you'd have to be blind not to see that, but um, to be able to you know, um, make much of that, particularly in England um, in the 19th century, which was to run counter to the prevailing economic and political uh, power establishment. So it was in particular the writing of one, actually American, um, someone named Henry George. Yes, of course. Um, anyway, sort of a, a well-known radical American sort of uh, writer and pamphleteer of the late 19th century. And it was, and he wrote a book that was very, very widely read called Progress and Poverty. And that came out in 1879. And what he wanted to show, or um, what George uh, wanted to show, that rather than prog progress leading automatically to betterment for all of society, progress, industrial, technological, economic, quote, progress, really was progress only for a very limited segment of that society, and that in this great contradiction, progress seemed to have as its sort of Siamese twin poverty, that the more scientific and technological advance you got, the greater was the um, class of the working poor and disenfranchised. So to make that long story short, um, uh, Wallace um, started on his path to becoming um, a socialist, um, which he then sort of, um, you know, later claimed he was in the 1890s and in the last 10 or 15 years of his life. And I think one of the earlier talks here that um, showed the um, uh, compared um, Wallace with the Russian um, anarchist Kropotkin. Um, um, shows that, you know, again, is another way of looking at Wallace's political views as really being um, uh, unacceptable in Britain at that time. So Wallace is, in a sense, um, fueling the, um, the sort of theoretical and, and um, 
uh, observational arsenal for his claim that scientific and technological advance does not res uh, result in widespread improvement for everyone, but indeed it may result initially and perhaps forever in a worsening of the economic divide. Um, and obviously these questions become um, really um, uh, continue to be controversial, um, of course, to our own day. The second work, which I would just like to mention, um, is a work of another American, um, Edward Bellamy. People heard of him in his work, Looking Backward. Um, in any event, um, excuse me, um, Bellamy's work, Looking Backward, was a sort of um, a socialist utopia. That is, the, uh, uh, Bellamy had the same sort of point of view as uh, uh, Henry George and Wallace was to adopt, um, uh, and saw as the only way out of this uh, type of sort of paradox of progress and poverty was to reform uh, society along socialist lines. Now, I don't want to get into an argument here um, about um, all that, um, but um, uh, what I'm trying to do, build up here is a picture of Wallace as really um, trying to uh, build up a worldview on all across the board, not just based on science, although um, Wallace was one of the um, foremost um, disciples of the scientific method, one of the greatest um, biologists of the 19th century or any other century perhaps, so one of the greatest sort of practitioners of the scientific method, but he connected that always with political impact, economic impact, cultural impact, class impact, and so forth. So uh, when Wallace receives an invitation to do a North American tour, um, uh, in 1886, 1887, he sort of jumps on it primarily because he's going to make some money. Um, I don't want to bore you with the sad details of Wallace's um, less than um, prosperous life, um, and for the reasons that you know just sort of outlined here, um, he never went as far as you might think in one field or another. Uh, um, because his unorthodox views always came to the fore. He basically, in a sense, never could keep his mouth um, shut. But um, he felt that the North American tour was a, sort of a, a year of lecture tours on um, evolution and natural selection um, uh, would be both um, give him and his family much needed money, but he would also be going to the land of Henry George and um, Edward Bellamy and really, you know, um, uh, get a bird's eye view of what was happening. And um, uh, during this North American tour, not only did, um, and he spent time in the major cities um, in the U.S. like Boston, Washington, New York, San Francisco, not only uh, did he give his lectures, which were well received, um, except the ones that he gave on spiritualism, and pardon me for this next speaker in the series, um, and, uh, and the ones he gave on socialism, um, and I'll read a couple of um, reviews of those that really uh, point to the um, paradox that Wallace seemed to present to his contemporaries, but um, not only was he lecturing um, successfully, but he was also meeting all the sort of first names and in American affairs, all the great you know, scientists, philosophers, educators, politicians, businessmen. He spent three months um, in Washington where he was wined and dined, so you might argue that you know, as a, a good socialist he shouldn't have done that, but um, you know, that's the way it is. But um, <laughs> he made a few exceptions in those cases. Um, and what he then uh, came to realize that indeed um, North America, rather than being the promised land, the land where the vices of old Europe would be left behind, and um, you know, the new Eden, the new um, Jerusalem uh, be founded, as he sort of traveled by train back um, 
and forth across different regions in the U.S. Um, he not and in different cities. He not only was struck by the immense poverty of this new Jerusalem, um, the fact that there seemed to be um, people who were poorer than the poorest people uh, in England, who were less um, healthy, less well housed, less well fed. How could this be in the land of sort of you know scientific and technological and industrial um, progress? Because um, uh, America in the late 19th century was really seen as the test case for all the sort of you know um, poster child of scientific and technological and industrial advance. Um, uh, as so, he not only saw problems that he was perhaps prepared to see in terms of social dysfunction, but he also saw what the effects of um, rampant industrialization, um, uh, the impact of that on the environment. And just let me quote a couple of things there uh, because um, um, I want to get to Wallace's major work. The um, We don't have that much time left. Got that, um, 10 minutes. Um, just to give a few quotes here from what Wallace is taking from his experiences in the United States. So, um, for example, um, when he's crossing the um, Rockies, um, yeah, he sees what's beautiful about the Rockies, but what he notices is, uh, quote, the effects of um, mining were already reducing many once fine and fertile valleys in the foothills of the Rockies to a waste of sand, gravel, um, and rock heaps. In Chicago, he was struck, quote, by numerous houses being constructed in bare open country, indications of a land boom, such as consequences such as continually are got up by speculators. Um, Chicago seemed to Wallace, quote, enveloped in a smoky mist worthy of London itself. It appeared as a London run riot, disfigured by the railroad companies and intense urban manufacturing and squalid living concentrations. Wallace endorsed uh, the opinion of a writer in one of the magazines, um, uh, in the U.S. who wrote in 18, 1887 that, quote, a whole huge continent has been so touched by human hands that over a large part of its surface it has been reduced to a state of unkempt, sordid ugliness. At the end of his American journey, Wallace um, visited two places in Canada. Because he knew that we would be talking about him here. So he had this dose of Canadian content. Um, first, he went to visit um, uh, um, uh, the home of a naturalist called Grant Allen, another biologist naturalist, um, a Canadian whom he knew um, had met in England. And this was on the banks of the shores of Lake Ontario in his beautiful home along the banks. And he was quite happy there. And he thought, well, maybe there's some hope um, in Canada. But then, of course, he um, got on a train to take him to Montreal. And when he was violence erupting over language rights. No, when he got to Montreal, uh, no, that's another story. When he, got, when he got to Montreal, he saw what he had seen in Chicago, a huge, ugly, black, smoking pit. Uh, you know, um, is this the best that Canada has to, to offer? So I think you're getting the message. Um, what Wallace then um, has now firmly when he gets back to England in 1888 is the following elements in his sort of witch's brew. Um, one is the observations that he's made not only in England and in Germany and France, but over North America and Canada that it seemed to him that the first uh, grand results of um, industrial and technological advance based upon science, um, scientific innovation was a horror story in pretty much um, every respect. Um, he also, I think, again, I'm not making the claim that he was ahead of his time, but it was just the way he looked at things. He also could not ignore the what we now know as the environmental cost 
to scientific and technological undertakings. And that was pretty much either not obvious if you weren't looking for it, or certainly ignored if you were uh, a proponent um, for big science, big technology, etc. So um, he sees um, his whole year spent in the United States just seemed to confirm in his mind um, the belief that he first um, uh, got with respect to um, the work, reading the works of uh, Bellamy and the works of Henry George, that there was a really um, dangerous paradox involved in the whole notion of advanced civilization. And it was, again, to repeat, and it seems pretty obvious, but it sort of doesn't go away. That paradox you know, remains that um, science and technology do not necessarily bring about um, a, uh, a better future for all. At most, it brings about, and what seemed, there's one quote here, let me just get this wall. This quote's going to fade by the wayside. Um, me one second. Oh, anyway, he um, can't get it now. But um, uh, he sees the greater separate that the the fruits of science and technological advance accrue to only a very small portion of the society, not even the one percent that we know about today. Uh, but the um, benefits of science and technology are by and large, at least the political and economic benefits, accruing to only a very uh, minute fraction of that society. So in Wallace's mind, um, there seemed to, be a, a in, to, seemed to be an inescapable conclusion that um, the problems with science and technology were um, fundamentally political, economic, cultural, and that if one were going to um, achieve the, the, the dream of a sort of a, a new paradise brought to humans by virtue of the gifts that science and technology could bestow, and certainly we're all you know, beneficiary, beneficiaries of that, one had to not ignore politics and ethics and um, class distinctions and education and all of that, but um, look at those as equally important to the scientific and technological advances that were being uh, raved about. So Wallace, and I think I'm getting towards the, um, close to the end here, or how much? Okay, then let me just go, okay. Um, there's a couple of, uh, actually, just quotes that I want to, um, oh, and a couple of other things that I want to bring out here. So. Um, uh, what I wanted to present here was that um, uh, what I termed Wallace and the problems of progress really turns on Wallace, knowing what he's talking about because he's right there at the forefront of the triumph of science and technology in the 19th century, but almost alone among those in the vanguard of scientific and technological triumph and all the political and economic forces allied with that, Wallace alone seemed to be pointing out the problems and saying you, um, if you don't look at the total package, remember what I said before that science um, in the 19th century was coming to assume its um, modern sort of guise of being a value-free, a neutral um, benevolent blueprint, if you use the scientific method, you automatically get the best, no matter what the political, economic, or social circumstances are. Wallace believed that that was um, at best naive or dangerous, really, that you had to look at the sort of environment in which science and technology was developing. Okay, so um, uh, to go, no, not to go back, come to uh, the work um, that I just want to conclude with, the, um, the wonderful century and what that is, for those of you that haven't read it yet, um, and actually it's uh, pretty amusing reading because he's got a very good um, sense of uh, humor. Um, uh, 
as well as a very sort of fine sort of uh, mind and writes very well, is um, he uh, half of the first part one deals with the um, successes of the 19th century electricity, transportation, steam engines, medical advances, etc. Et and then part two, and there shouldn't have been, according to most of his audience, a part two, um, all of the negative aspects um, that we've been uh, going over. So that um, Wallace then sets the, you know, the tone of his whole book, of his book, um, and to repeat that quote that was used at the beginning, um, uh, in his preface to this uh, book, The Wonderful Century, a Wallace says, quote, a comparative estimate of the number and importance of its achievements leads to the conclusion that not only is our 19th century superior to any that has gone before it, but that it may best be compared or it may be best compared with the whole preceding period. It must, therefore, um, be held to constitute the beginning of a new era of human uh, progress. But Wallace then immediately throws in a major caveat or warning. However, along with these marvelous successes, perhaps in consequence of them, there have been equally striking failures, some intellectual, but for the most part moral and social. No doubt it will be objected that I have devoted far too much space to them, more than half the volume. But this was inevitable for the very obvious reason that whereas, whereas the successes are universally and easily admitted and have only to be described, the failures are either ignored or denied and therefore require to be proved. It is thus necessary, Wallace says, to give a tolerably full summary of the evidence in every case in which an allegation of failure has been made. So Wallace is, you know, um, what he considered his most important work, we probably, well, I don't even know that, um, you know, might disagree, um, but nonetheless a pretty important work which was um, by and large ignored by the establishment for all the reasons that you might well imagine, was that, um, uh, uh, to repeat, it's, it's a simple message, if I may just say so. It's a simple message, but one which seems very hard to grasp or to implement, that in order to enjoy the blessings of anything, but let's say the blessings of science and technology, you have to know what the um, negative consequences might be so as to avoid them. And for the solutions Wallace offered, they were pretty much uh, no more popular than his diagnosis of the problem of the um, uh, the problems of progress. You know, basically had to do with uh, a society reformed on the basis of socialism, a society um, in which there was complete economic equality. You tell that to um, John D. Rockefeller or Andrew Carnegie um, or the rest of them. Oh Lord. Black, uh, that, uh, whoops, uh, uh, if you had not about it, you would have included him. So um, we'll just, you know, I just want to conclude on that point that um, it was these sort of, um, sort of provocations that Wallace put forth that really annoyed many of his fellow scientists because they said, you're just throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Why don't you just shut up and do what the rest of us scientists are doing, doing our own work. You're the brilliant other half of the Darwin Wallace team. But Wallace just became more and more outspoken in the last 20 years of his life and wrote and uh, spoke wherever he could and get a hearing wherever he could about what we might call the other side of, of Wallace. And so I just wanted to give, um, since th this series is looking at, um, it's more than natural selection, looking at things other than, sci than Wallace's um, uh, uh, profound scientific accomplishment, accomplishments. I just wanted to look at what's not been really um, that much sort of studied um, a at all were Wallace's views on progress. And I, well, I have to leave it to you. I don't force it down anybody's throat. But I think that there are <laughs> some lessons to be learned about um, what he said 150 years ago. So that is it.